you guys have your Bibles, why don't we turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I um, am blessed to be on our district board, and um, you guys are actually a little bit blessed too, because uh, you guys get the inside scoop sometimes. And, uh, but I'm doing this because I want to make sure that us as a church are doing the very best that we can to make sure while we're building a church here, because this is where our mission field is, that we never forget that we're part of the church. It's not just the mission. And uh, we want to do our best to support what God is doing through the church. And so it's going to be on the video, so nobody can say that they didn't know. But you guys get to hear before most people, because I'm on the district board, that next year, momentum is going to be July 14th through the 17th. July 14th through the 17th. So I said it twice. It's on the video. You can go back and check it out. I'm telling you now because I'd like to see everybody at momentum next year. I think everybody should be there. The, the district superintendent told us he's not going to let his name stand which I'm sad about. He's been my superintendent for a long time. I think he's pretty amazing. You know, I'm a little biased, but it doesn't mean I'm wrong. But whoever is elected, whoever that, this is going to be their first district function and event. Oh, you're elected pastor. Oh, boy, Bob. (laughs) But whoever, whoever the Lord and the ministry decides is going to lead, it would be nice if there wasn't 10 people there. And so we want to make sure that we support whomever it is in whatever direction they're going. Plus, we want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When they get together, we want to make sure they're there. So um, I think Cody had worked it out. And um, if you want to go to Momentum next year, you probably should save about, I think it'll cost you about $10 or $11 a week. And you can easily, and you can have extra money to spend. And so I think probably most of us, if we start now, we can afford it if we start now and just plan ahead. We'll get you as many details as we can moving forward, but I just think it's, a, it's an important thing for those of you who are there. God started moving the district in a really good direction. We haven't reached our peak yet. We got work to do, but I feel like we started heading in the right direction, so you don't want to miss what God does in these types of places. It's really powerful stuff. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to begin. I'm just going to read three verses of scripture, and I'll just cover a lot so we don't have to stand a long time and read a lot, but Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 20 says, so he, and I'll I'll explain all this to you as we go through the lesson. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You can be seated today as I do my best to talk to you guys about desired consequences. Desired consequences consequences. I hope everybody's doing their daily devotion. All right. If you're doing it like our family's doing it, then you know that these lessons are important. And my job today to set us up for these lessons so we can stay in unity, make sure the Lord's working on us, helping us, um, because he knows what we're going to face this week. I need to make sure that we understand that God's word is the only sure foundation for our lives. And if that's true, then we need to learn to rely on his word and not our own logic and thinking when they head in different directions. So you know exactly what the point is now. Now let's see if we can get there. Does anybody know, what does consequences mean? The punishment? What what did you say, Brother Brother D? Punishment for your actions. What were you going to say, Jake? The response to something? Venus? Hang on one second. Venus? The results of choices? What were you going to say, Sandra? It slipped your mind. You, if you Raise your hand if it comes back to you. So is consequence a good thing or is it a bad thing? 
it's a bad thing. It can be both. It can be both. It can be both. So what, what makes it good or bad? The situation, how you do it. So let's, let's put it in context then. So if somebody comes to you and says, if, if you exercise, Brother Reuben, ate, and eat well, there's going to be consequences for that. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Conversely, if I go to Bob and say, Bob, if you don't exercise and you eat cake for breakfast and ice cream for lunch and fried chicken and french fries for dinner, there's going to be consequences for that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. So consequences, I like what Cole and what Venus were saying. Basically, another word for consequences is results, right? They are the results of what you have done. And so in life, there's always going to be a result. When you do something, there's going to be a result. It'll either be a good result or it'll be a bad result. If you do nothing, there will either be a good result or there will be a bad result. Is there anybody in here who wants to live life with bad results? I don't either. But do you think we always live that way? No, I don't always live that way either, right? How many of us were living a life with bad results, but we continue to live that way? God's wanting to come into the church today and say, why don't we start living with some desired consequences? Why don't we start setting our life in a direction where we get the results that we want, right? How many people are living life in depression and anxiety, but you're refusing to change? How many people are leaving f- frustrated lives? Or, or how many people maybe are flirting with God? Like, I'm faithful sometimes, I'm not faithful others, I'm faithful some, And you just feel stuck, right? The Bible even tells you that way. Like, the, the most miserable person on the planet isn't the person who completely hates God or completely loves Him. It's the person who's always standing in the middle somewhere. Yeah, they're the most miserable. So if your life and mine, if it's always going to have results or consequences, I think we should start paying attention to them and say, what are the consequences that I'm creating in my life? And what changes do I need to make so that I can end up living a life with the consequences that I want, the results that I want? So if I want good, good, good results, isn't it hard to make good choices if you don't have good information? Yeah, so we just had a flood, right? You know, we have this big flood, and it's, you know, let, let's say that, that Annie needed me to pick her up and give her a ride because she was out on her motor scooter flying around town, and then one of these rivers just wiped out the road. So now Annie is stuck down the road with her super-powered chair that I've seen her flying around in, but it can't go through water. And she's like, Pastor, I need you to pick me up. It's like, sure, I'll come pick you up. And she's down by Spalding High School, but she tells me she needs to be picked up by Price Chopper. So the desired result when I leave in my car is to get Annie back to her house. But if the information that I'm given isn't good, I will not have the desired result or consequence. I get to Price Chopper and you are still stranded by Spalding High School. I do not have the desired, if we have faulty or bad information, it makes it harder to make good choices. And when we don't look to the word of God for those things, there's all sorts of things that can sound wonderful, but don't lead us where we want to go. How how many people have heard this? You can be anything you want to be. Yeah, don't we tell people this? We do. It's not true. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Linda, you can be anything you want to be. We tell kids this stuff. Let me just make it practical for you. If everybody in this building wanted to be president of the United States, we can't all be president. Even if we said, okay, let's just split up in four-year increments. We can all take turns. Let's start doing the math. Some of us will be dead before it's our turn. And we're only talking about the people in this building. What if everybody on the planet wanted to be president of the... It, it, you can't be anything you want to be. But we understand the sentiment. If somebody wants to be present, I think it's a good thing to say, well, then why don't you try to pursue that? Because what we're trying to say is some people quit on their life and their dreams before ever trying to achieve them. 
So it has a good sentiment. And so a lot of times we buy into these things. The problem is it's not true. Or how about this? If you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. No! How many times have you tried as hard as you can and you failed? Yeah, I've, I've, that's happened a lot. Or, or how many times? You, you, great resume, right? You practiced all the interview questions and you weren't the one who was... Or how about this? Everybody's a winner. No! Everybody does not win. Ten people apply for a job and there's only one opening. Nine people lose. But what we're trying to say is you never know until you try. So there's a good sentiment behind these things. But if we buy into a lot of philosophies that we hear in society today, we don't end up with the results in life that we want. And it makes us angry and frustrated. And then you come across someone who actually tries to tell you the truth. Everybody's not a winner. And they're like, well, you're a jerk. We're going to give all the kids trophies. You're a downer. It's like, yeah, but I'm trying to teach them something. We're not setting them up so that they can make good choices in their life. And if we have bad information, we won't get the desired results. We raise people that can't handle adversity. We raise people that can't hear the word no. We raise people who always have an excuse for bad behavior and it's never their own fault. And so they stay stuck with bad consequences, with difficult lives. God's wanting to say, why don't we stop buying into all this stuff and get back to the book that's always been been there has never failed and let's start getting some desired consequences okay does anybody in here know everything i'm not asking if you know someone that thinks they know everything because we probably all could raise our hands there but do you do you, do you think anybody in here knows everything no. yeah you don't let me prove it to you what color socks is ben whitney wearing today She's just guessing now. Yep. We got green. We got white. You might guess it, but you don't. How much gas is in Cole's car right now? <laughs> See, we're guessing. We don't know, right? And those are easy things. If you looked at Ben's socks today, that would have been an easy thing. You go out and look in Cole's window because he doesn't have one of these digital cars, you know, yet. You can, but, but now ask about people's thoughts, their opinions, their feelings, that's not as easy as the color as somebody's socks, right? We don't know everything. But do you like being told what to do? I don't usually. Do you like being told what to do? Depends who it is or when it is sometimes, right? Yeah, or how they do it, right? So here's this conundrum we're in. Right? Society's pushing all sorts of things at us that if we're not careful, we buy into them and we do not get desired consequences. So we admit, but I need some help, but I don't like, I don't like being told what to do. So here's the thing. If, if you knew everything, then you wouldn't need help from anybody else. But since you don't and I don't, then we have to admit, I have to sometimes have something or someone speak into my life. And every week, that's why we say, so we, I think we've got like eight or nine voting members in our church. It went down from like 28 or something. And you know, most of the reasons why people aren't voting members is people aren't praying and people aren't reading their Bible. If you don't know everything and I don't know daily, I don't know everything and we're supposed to be Christians, where do you think we get the right direction from? If you don't know everything and I don't, then we need to make sure we have a good source. And if you and I think that God is the source of real truth, he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, then you and I have to make a decision. If I want good or desired consequences, I need to let him tell me what truth is so that I can make decisions that I know will give me the consequences or the results that I want. Why do we push this all the time? Because I want you to have results in your life that are beneficial. I want you to have desirable or desired consequences. I have to cover two passages of scripture, so I have to go quickly to stay with our devotions for the week. But has anybody heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Right? Be added to blessed are the, for they shall inherit. You know, Jacob was talking about some of this, and 
In the Sermon of the Mount, we're supposed to be salt and we're supposed to be light. Wasn't Brother Cody Griggs talking about that a few weeks ago? Like the Sermon on the Mount covers a whole lot of things. I wrote some of them down just so I can share them with you. I'll go slow, but in the, it's important because of where we're going. But in the Sermon on the Mount, he shares, you know, the blessed are those. We just talked about that. That believers are supposed to be salt and light. Cody talked to us about that. He talked about how our issues in life begin in our heart. That's where they begin. This is stuff he's sharing. That marriage is sacred. Boy, don't we need to hear that again. Amen. Yeah, man, every time you get mad, we're done, right? It's sacred. This is something that's between us and the Lord, too, that we should love our enemies. That's a fun one, right? Yeah, no. If you've never had to do it, you might think it's easy, but it's not. He teaches us how to pray that we need to make sure that we fast to please God and not be noticed by others, to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. He shared that we can't serve God and money, that we must trust God so that we don't live in fear or worry. We need to check ourselves before we judge other people. It's on the video. I know I'm going quick. I don't have a lot of time. That the way to heaven is narrow, that we will know others by the fruit they produce in their lives, that we need to do God's will or we won't make it to heaven. This is all stuff he's covering. And then at the very end, so he shares all of this wisdom. At the very end, he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to him to a wise man who built his house upon a and he says, then the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house, but it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. So what he was saying is, I just shared with you the secrets of life. And at the very end, he said, if you hear these words and you don't do them, you're not going to have the desired consequence that you're looking for. He Notice, the rain and the flood and the wind came to both houses. There are so many times through scripture that Jesus lets everybody know, bad things happen to everybody. I don't care if you and I think we're good or we think we're bad. Bad, difficult things happen to everybody everybody and God keeps telling us that through scripture so what he's trying to say is if good or difficult things are going to happen to everybody there are things you can do so that when the storm comes when it's over you can have the desired consequence of not falling apart you know the issue that a lot of us have our house is built for sunny days yeah, the, the location we've built our house on, the materials we've built our house on, they're built for sunny days. How do I know that? Because some of us, as soon as difficult things happen, boom, we can't function. Some of the things our leaders have had to deal with lately, the phone calls we've been getting, the issues people are struggling with are not hard issues. Our lives have been built on the sand, so when difficulty comes, Bam, we don't have a, our lives completely fall because we have built a life for God that only holds up on sunny days. So you know who the foolish man is? The foolish man is someone who's trying to build their house. They're trying to live for God, but not live all of God's word. That's what it means. I'm building a Christian life, but Jesus said, if you hear my words and do them, you are building your Christian life on something solid that won't fall over. But if you don't listen and then do what he said, you are trying to be a Christian, but you're building your life not where he said to build it. Is your walk with God built just for sunny days? You might say, no, it's not. No, it's built for rainy days. Then how have you reacted when things have gone not your way the last four or five weeks? Maybe the last four or five days. The last time your life got turned upside down, how did you react? Because if you fell apart, God's trying to say, you have built your house. You go to church every Sunday. You know what the Bible says. You're trying to build a walk with God without building your life on the things he taught. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it's like if you hear this and you don't do it, your life will not be solid. The results or the consequences will be every time something difficult happens, your life will fall to pieces. But if you want to be able to take, storms will happen to you no matter how good or how bad you are. The only decision we have is if we're going to make it through the storm or not. You can make it. I can make it. I was telling the Rubenates because they, they, their car didn't work and then they had a 
rental car accident, and everything tried to keep them from going to momentum. And Brother Rubinate was just being a human being and saying, boy, this week's been horrible. And I kept saying, no, it hasn't been. It's been wonderful. Because when you're weak, no, nothing challenging happens. You didn't win any victory. There's nothing to testify about, nothing. But when everything went wrong and you still made it to momentum and still participated, you have a testimony now that you couldn't have had if those things hadn't happened. You see, the rains came and the floods came and the winds blew, but your house didn't fall down because it was built on something solid. There are people who barely made it to momentum or didn't go because of how they felt in their body or because of the way someone else acted or reacted when we had people getting hit by cars that were still going there. Their bellies hurt. I mean, again, the rains came. Everybody's belly hurts sometimes. I'm tired. Everybody gets, I could hardly move after Tuesday night. I don't know if it looks easy when I'm jumping around up there. I can't do it any other way, but I'm starting to feel that now. I felt like I'd get hit with a Mack truck after I was done preaching on Tuesday, but I was there Tuesday night, and I was there Wednesday because I learned that, that if I do what he tells me to do, the next time my life gets hit, I won't fall apart. I will make it. He said, those who do my word, hear it and do it, you can't just rip their lives apart. They don't fall apart like that. And then I've got to move on, although I've got so much more to say about that. Keeping my eye on the clock here. I've got too much to cover today. But we get back to our text, which is where we started at the very beginning. When Jesus is like, okay, I taught you how to live life. So there's all these things I shared with you in the Sermon of the Mount. If you do them, your life won't just get washed out every time there's difficulty. But then he's like, if you live like this, later on, Jesus is telling a bunch of stories right before he's getting ready to be crucified. So earlier in my ministry, I taught you how to live everyday life. This is what you do every day. And you know what the result is going to be? Is there's going to be one day when I'm going to come back for the church. He tells this story about wise and foolish virgins. And the story, I can't tell the whole thing, but basically what it was to illustrate is when I come back for the church someday, some people are going to be ready and some people are not going to be ready. And if you're not ready, there's going to be some consequences that you don't want. If you want to make it to heaven someday, if that's your desired consequence, then you need to make sure when I come back for the church that you have not just heard my word, but that you're actually living my word. And so he shares this story, this is where our text comes from, where he says the kingdom of heaven is like this. So he's saying this is how, I'm going to use a story, but I'm telling you how the church works. It's like a master who he was getting ready to leave. Jesus knew he was going to die for our sins. After he rose from the grave, he ascended into heaven. It's like a master who, who had to go on a journey. But before he did, he goes to his servants, and to one servant he gave him five talents. Now this isn't talents like... You went like, I can spin a basketball on my finger, or I can stand on my head, or I can play the saxophone, you know, like, I don't know, blowing out of my nose, you know? It's like, that's not the type. Talent was like a, a sum of money, and it was a lot. I've got all sorts of numbers, and they're all different, but what they all have in common is that it was a lot. And so the first servant, he gave five talents, a lot of money. Second one, he gave two talents, a lot of money. The last one, what still, though... One person said a talent was 20 years worth of wages. Now, I don't think it was that much with all the other numbers, but my point is it was a lot of money. So one was not nothing. So he went away. Then later on, he came back. Christ is going to come back for the church someday. And he looks at the servants and he says, what did you guys do? And that was our text. The servant with five said, I doubled it. So when you come back, I don't just have five. I've got, I built my house upon the rock. When the floods came, like, look, I made it through. I did exactly what you, I now have. And then the one who had two, right in our text, he's like, guess how many I have now? Four total. I built my house upon the rock. I'm solid. When you're coming back, I got four. The last one, though, was like, he's got, how much do you have? You got one? How come? Well, I was worried that I wouldn't do this thing right, so I took that talent and I just buried it. And when you came back, here it is. God had some some things that, there was consequences for that. The Bible says he was cast into outer darkness. I gave you, I gave you something and I expected you to do something with it. 
And if you do nothing with it, one day I'm coming back and I'm going to say, I gave you the things to do, but you just listened. You didn't actually do them. He's going to come back for the church someday. I heard this story about this lady this last week. Her name was Martha Berry, and she had this vision of building this, this home to help underprivileged or homeless children. And this was a long time ago. She went to Henry Ford. It's a while ago. And asked him for money. He reached in his pocket and he gave her a dime. This dude was a multimillionaire when a million dollars was even more than it is now. Gave him a dime. She didn't throw a fit. The floods came. The winds blew. She got a dime. But she's like, you know what? She took it. She bought some seeds. She, she, she grew a crop. She sold the crop, bought more seeds. After three or four harvests, she had enough crops where she went and bought a property. And then she went back to Henry Ford, and she didn't go back and say, you had a million dollars, and you gave me a dime. Look what I did. She went back and said, thank you so much for the dime. I want you to know what I did with this dime. And this time, he was so moved that he gave her one million dollars to then fund everything that needed to go on inside of the building to support these children. The point was, all she was given was a dime. But she said, I'm going to do the best I can with what I've been given. And because of that, a dream came true. And God is wanting us, if you want to go to heaven someday, if you want a solid life, if you want a productive life, then we have to do the best we can with what God has given us. Because one day he's coming back for the church. He said it right before this parable. And he's going to expect us to be ready. And being ready means I'm living what he said. Being ready means whatever talent he gave me, I'm going to do my best with that talent. He took the talent from the one person who did nothing with it. And he gave it to the person who turned the five into ten. He said, you take this because you've shown me that you know what to do with it. Some people in our church at times have felt passed over for things. I don't feel involved. Well, it's because you've buried what God has given you and you're not doing anything with it. And you look at someone else getting blessed. You know why God keeps giving them opportunities that you feel like you could do? Because they're doing the best they can with their talent. And when we bury ours, eventually God's like, you are the best person for that. But you bury, it says he gave to each according to their own ability. There was a reason he was given that one, but because he didn't use it, he's like, I'm going to give it to the people that show me they're going to do something with what they have. You know that the one talent was not less talented than the five talent servant, but we think of it that way. There are, um, I hope I can say this, Cody, you can tell me not to if you don't want to, but Cody and I, sometimes I can feel a little bit of friction between the two of us, and he's got the best attitude in the world, but you know Why? Because he's a detail-oriented person, and I want to get things done. You're working through 15 guitar leads. Can we practice already? And he's right, and I'm fine with my way, too. The point is, he can sit down and work on a guitar lead for five hours, and I can work on a guitar lead for five seconds. Some people have been given one talent, and I'm not even saying you're a one talent person, but I'm trying to illustrate something. One talent people are not less talented, but what it is, is they're capable of taking one thing and sitting down and ripping it all apart and really making the most. They take a detailed look at one thing. You give the five talent person a one thing and they're bored after 30 seconds and they waste it. And they don't get everything. We would not have leads in here if I was the lead guitar player. Because it requires someone who can sit down and really just dedicate themselves for hours. And I would fail. And we wouldn't have that if somebody wasn't detail-oriented. We come in and all of our stuff is set up. All the, all the backing tracks and the tempos. Because somebody is willing to sit down for hours. For some of you are like, I can do that. For some of you are like, that sounds like jail. It's not, tell me that Cody, because he's detail-oriented, is not less important than somebody who can't sit down for hours. If you think it's less important, you haven't worked with him. A lot of what we are today is because he's willing to sit down and do those types of things. That's a fact. So a one-talent person, if it's, they can just sit there and, and, and plug things. The five-talent person will not dig as deep oftentimes, but they can juggle 
15 different things all at once. You ever been around someone? You're around them and you just get tired watching them. Like, how do they do that? They absolutely do. Because while you're figuring one thing out, I'm juggling it. But guess what? As soon as you're done, you throw that to me, I throw it up, and I throw you another thing over there that has to still be worked out. There's a symbiotic relationship that exists there. And so the one talent person didn't realize you're just as important as this person. But as soon as you wouldn't do it, it's not going to be like what it was, but I'll throw that over to the five talent person because I know they can, it'll never be what it could have been because it wasn't developed like it should have been. So they're just going to keep throwing it. It'll stay in the air, but it'll never be what it was like if this person hadn't dug into it and said, I'm not less important. It's just a different role in the same body. We've got to start seeing according to each one's ability, not because one was less or more important. They're just different, and they're all important. So filling those roles within the church makes the church more what it was supposed to be. Desired consequences. God's coming back for the church someday. And one, a one group of people is going to go to the left. The Bible says hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. That is not the results I want from my life. I want him to say, text, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the little things that I gave you. Now you're going you're gonna to reap a whole, whole lot of amazing things. That is a desired consequence. So here's really the crux of the whole thing. Some of us have been told you can be anything you want. That's garbage. I understand the sentiment. It's very kind, but it's not true. Some people have been told if you work hard, you can accomplish anything. I understand the sentiment. It's kind, but it's not true. There are no losers. I understand the sentiment, but it's not true. But you know there is a way to live life that will give you a desired consequence that's greater than anything you can accomplish in this world, that you and I are capable of being good, right? How? By learning the word and doing what it says, receiving the Holy Ghost and allowing it to give us the ability to live scripture. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will let us do that. You can be good, and you know what else you can be? Faithful. Everybody can actually do that. And if you're good, and if you're faithful, there's a desired consequence. Everybody can make it to heaven if they want to. Everybody can't be president of the United States. But everybody can go to heaven if they want to. That one job opening, everybody can't have that one job opening. But if you and I focus on being good, what is it? Don't be hearers only doers of the word. Everybody can be good and everybody, God gave us certain talents and abilities. I'm going to make sure I make them, I'm going to do the best I can. You can be good and you can be faithful and if you do and I do we will have the ultimate desired consequence. Not just of heaven but again when he did what he was supposed to do his life blossomed. Five talents became ten. Two talents became four. Our life will start being productive if we stop just listening and start doing the holy ghost gives us the ability to live the word that's in the bible some things you can't do in scripture without the holy ghost but once you have the holy ghost the bible says you're able to do everything that's in that book it's you're 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 capable of it now so that's all the time that i have you guys i wish i could have shared so much more on this topic but i had to confess to some of our leaders today I've been a little ornery the last couple of weeks. Some of you are like, really? Some of you are like, yep. But what, what everything, there's been some prophesying that's been going on. Everything is leading to one particular thing. And this is what it is. God is opening a door of opportunity for our church. And I feel like there's about 10 or 11 people who are actually ready to take advantage of it. And that's positive because there's 10 or 11 people, but it's also troubling because there's more than 10 or 11 people in our church. But the, the reason I've been ornery is some of the things I've had to deal with over the last three weeks, I've thought, do you really think your pastor should be working with an issue like that? Are you, are you kidding me? And I'm ornery because, I mean, there's an open door. And, 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 and I know doors don't stay open forever. The Lord said, seek me 
Wow, I, that means he's not always right there doing what. So when he is, I'm just feeling antsy because there's an opportunity. And if we don't start doing what we're supposed to do, the one day that door won't be open. So I'm saying to the 10 or 11 people, and you probably know who you are, would you join with me and try something? What? Just try, ask somebody for a Bible study. Ask somebody to go to church. Just do something. Would you help me do something? But pardon me if you're not one of those 10 or 11, if I'm seeming a little ornery because I'm tired of dealing with things that we shouldn't be dealing with. And most of them are a direct result of the fact that we're not busy enough doing the things of God. But I'm so busy. For everybody in who thinks they're busy, I, will, I would like to challenge you. Do not play one game on your phone, watch one show or one movie for an entire week, and I want you to tell me how busy you are. Go ahead. Chal I challenge you. Let's start calling it what it is. This isn't about busy. This is about us trying to build a life for God on the sand. We've built our lives for sunny days. The problem is storms are coming. Storms are coming. We need to be ready for, because I want desired consequences. So I've been a little ornery, and I'm sorry if I bothered anybody. Tell me, and I'll apologize to you. But I'm antsy because I'm sensing a door opening. And if we don't take advantage of this, God will find somebody else to do what he's wanting to do here. And I don't want that. I want to be a part of it. He's coming back someday. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. This week... I think this topic of God's word is solid and we need to submit to it. For many people in here, I think we're going to want to cash it in. Like it's too simple or basic for us. But I think we do. Like really? That's what we got to talk about all week? God's word is true and I need to live it? That's going to be applicable to us until he comes back for the church. Is, is anybody in here everything that God wants them to be? I certainly know I'm not. And here's the way it works if you haven't discovered it yet. As soon as I do something for the Lord... There's something else. You never get there. And so I would like to ask some of you in this place, when was the last time you took another step toward Jesus? When was the last time you got something out of your life that you know shouldn't be there and took another step toward God? Because I think, unfortunately, that's the majority of us in this place. We've just been living the same relationship with God for so long. that We need this week. What thing am I not doing that I need to do? If there are people who are coming to our church that don't want to get closer to God, you're still welcome to come. But we've got to go forward. And we're not being mean, but we can't stay with you if you don't want to get closer to Jesus. We've got to get closer to God. And at any point, come with us. But I can't stay here when he's calling us higher. It's time to get to some of these desired concepts. They're out there for us. If you want to be miserable, I can't stop you. But I want joy unspeakable and full of... Brother Russell preached about joy. Some of you said you want that. I heard it from some people this last week. You know how you have that joy? Do what the Bible says. Because then when the storm's raging, you're just sitting in your house like, this is a wicked storm. But I'm all good. You see people floating down the street like we did. And your house is dry because I built it in the right place time to build something solid Amen. time to get some some desired consequences thank you for taking the time to listen i went a little bit over today i wish i had two hours today my heart is full i got so much to share with you guys but god is just showing us things so get ready because you're either going to get left behind not because we don't want you or you're ready and you're going to hear it and you're going to jump in with me and we're going to go do some cool stuff god's wanting to use us somebody pray until you start feeling it I believe God would show somebody today what he's been trying to show me if you just open yourself up to it. He'll lay a passion and a burden on you that'll get you up in the morning. You won't have trouble wanting to go and pray and read your Bible because you just feel God saying, I got something for you today. I got something for you today. I got something for you today. What were you saying? Jump in, dive in. What were you saying? Like you were shouting at us for like five minutes. I don't even remember what it was. Get in. Get in, right? It's weird. Get in. Get in. So we'll take our time to fellowship now with Brother Russell's yelling still ringing in our ears. Get, get in, get in. He's becoming a preacher, man. We're proud of him.